transportation of a breathing human lung. Dr. Ali Fali has received several awards for his work, including the Ellis Island Medal of Honor by the National Ethnic Coalition of Organizations in 2017. The medals uh, are awarded annually to the group of distinguished U.S. citizens who ex exemplify a life of uh, a life of a life dedicated to community service. Professor Adahali has been a faculty at UCLA since 1997. He has served as the chief of cardiothoracic surgery as West Los at West Los Angeles Veterans Hospital from 1998 to 2012. Uh, he has authored numerous books, uh, book chapters, and more than 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts and abstracts. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Adahali, for being with us this evening. Uh, uh, I know you're super busy, so thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and share your perspective and your experience with us. Thank you for the uh, invitation. And um, I also want to acknowledge and uh, congratulate the your uh, student association, the Iranian Students of California, for creating this network a platform where ideas can be exchanged, networking can happen, mentorship can happen. And, um, and I think that this is a, uh, a welcome addition in the state of California. And I hope that all the members benefit from all the uh, uh, potential options and, and uh, help that you can provide. Thank you, Dr. Uh, for the kind words. So let's first talk about the organ care system. Uh, you were, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, you were one of the, uh, you were the first surgeon to do a breathing lung transplant. Uh, I've read uh, a lot, uh, actually I remember when the news came out, I read the article, I was an undergrad. And uh, would, if you uh, would please uh, tell us about the OCS and what are its benefits and what are its potentials for the future of the field. Um, as you know, we've been doing heart transplantation for about uh, 53 years. The first heart transplant was performed in 1968 in South Africa by a surgeon named Christian Barnard. And um, ever since, we have been sending a team out to where a brain dead donor is located, where the team basically stops the donor heart and puts it on ice in an igloo cooler and brings the heart to the transplant center. We've been doing this for the past 50 some years and there has not been any major advances. We continue to use ice and the cooler that we, uh, we pick up at, at Target or, or places similar to that. So one of the um, facts that had been intriguing the um, many people's mind is that what if we can somehow maintain the human heart or the human lung in a better state during transportation. As you can imagine, human organs are not meant to be kept on ice. Irreversible, irreversible damage occurs over time. So when we do it on ice, we have to uh, expedite the process. We only have about four to six hours. So we do the transplant in the middle of the night or whenever that the organ becomes available. We use Lear jets. We use all sorts of mechanisms to be able to minimize the period of time that the organ is kept on ice. So the concept of organ care system, although it has been interesting to many surgeons and physicians for the past many decades, it has never become a clinical reality because of the technical issues. And the fact is that a human organ has never been kept outside of a human body for any period of time in a live state. So the concept behind organ care system is to take some of the brain dead donor blood when the brain dead donor is dying, take some of their blood, put it in a machine and have the machine pump the blood through the organ. So when you put the organ on the machine, it actually has its own blood the donor blood circulating through it. So as far as that heart is concerned, there is no change as opposed to being in the chest or being on the machine. It continues to beat, it continues to occasionally pump, and it's in a warm physiologic state. When it comes to the lung, the blood circulates through the lung and the machine continues to give breaths to the lung. So you actually can see the lung 
um, inhaling and exhaling in the process. What are the potential benefits of this technology? Number one is that the organ that we receive before the transplant is a better organ because it has not been preserved on ice and it has not been subjected to the injuries that are known to occur with organ preservation on ice. Number two is that it gives us a potential platform that we can make changes in the donor organ. What are some of the changes? Well, we can make it better. We can somehow, uh, if, if a donor lung has a pneumonia, we can treat it with high concentrations of antibiotics. If there are other issues, and I can, I can list the potential options. We've done some of it, but I think the future is what the potential of this technology is. And uh, we can talk about it at, at a later time point, but I think that the immediate benefits of this technology is to allow us to use a better donor organ. And then the second thing is that it allows us, instead of rushing and doing it within four to six hours, maybe expand that time period. Uh, really a great feat of uh, medicine, but also a great feat of engineering. Uh, how did you, uh, as a physician, think about like, because this, this, this to me seems like a more of an engineering uh, ish, a problem that an engineer would address. And how did you as a physician think about this uh, solution to this problem? Well, I think this, the technology, all the components exist. It's a matter of putting the technologies to get together, optimize it and working with the, uh, the experts in the field to come up with the most suitable platform that can keep the organs alive and keep it safe. As you can imagine, getting something like this through the FDA could not be easy. It took us in excess of 10 years and, and multiple studies to demonstrate, number one, the safety and then the effectiveness of this technology when compared to the old system. The old system is very simple, very easy, because you just put it on ice and you bring it to the recipient hospital. With this technology, we have to keep the donor heart um, perfused. We have to make sure that there is no injuries to it. And we have learned a lot over the past 10 years and we continue to improve the technology as time goes on. Great, definitely uh, life saving and life changing uh, technology and something that would change the field uh, for the future. Um, so uh, let's take a little, uh, trip down the memory lane and talk about uh, the, uh, when you came to Iran, because uh, you were born in Tehran, I think. Yeah. And uh, then you came, then you immigrated to the United States at 16. So uh, I wanted to ask like, what do you remember from back then? Uh, how was the, um, how that experience uh, shaped you as a person that you are now? Well, I, I have uh, very fond memories of Iran. I uh, came here before the revolution, just, just before the revolution. And um, I finished high school here. And it's ironic that um, my high school years were some of the best years that, that I recall. And uh, when I came here and um, I only spent nine months in school and I didn't study because I knew pretty much everything that the teacher was teaching, maybe even more at times because the, the education in Iran is so strong and so um, uh, solid that uh, many of us who come here, we notice that there is actually, we are farther ahead than many of our classmates. Um, I think in reference to your question, how my education in Iran um, changed me, I think that it, it had fundamental influence on who I am and what I wanted to do. I knew that I was gonna become a physician at that point. Um, and I was on a student visa. So, and that was at the time of uh, Iran-Iraq war. And, uh, and they had about 52 American hostages in the US embassy at the time. And that was exactly when I was applying to medical school. And um, so I did apply and I know that my GPA was not that bad, and but the first year I did not get in. Um, and I'm sure you'll learn from my background that I went into engineering. 
And um, I got my master's degree in, in engineering while I was applying. And that was, again, at the time when, because of the American hostages, we were being asked, and I was stu still on a student visa, we were being asked that we need to show up to um, international student offices on every six months or so for, at that time, they used to call it INS, Immigration and Naturalization Services. And um, just during that time, I was applying to medical school, and it was not a very good time to be Iranian on a student visa applying to medical school trying to get in. Wow, that's, uh, it's always not good to be Iranian on a student <laughs> visa. Uh, it's but always it's, like it's challenging. Done, it's done better. It's done better. Yeah, so it's always like challenging. I, I've seen, I have a lot of friends that here are uh, are here on visas, and they all have like stories. And I'm sure it was uh, very more challenging in the 1970s, I think. 80s, 80s, yes. And yeah, um, okay. Uh, you touched uh, on your education uh, as a, as an undergrad. Uh, just for the audience, you did uh, you got your bachelor's degree in biology and biochemistry from Rutgers, and then did the chemical and biochemical engineering masters there. So the reason you did the master, were you interested in chemical and biochemical engineering or it was because of the, well, the med school application situation? Well, I did have some interest in engineering and I had the, the background and I'd taken some of those courses before and, um, and I actually applied and um, after my master's and uh, believe it or not, I actually got accepted at the chemical and biochemical engineering at Stanford for a wow. PhD. And I also, that year, I also got accepted to medical school and I decided to pursue a career in medicine. Um, I don't know, maybe a career in engineering at Stanford at that time may not have been a bad career either, but, um, but I decided to pursue medicine because of the, uh, um, obviously my personal interest in this and, and the fact that I thought that uh, my passion was more towards dealing with human beings and, and, uh, and caring for them rather than looking broadly on, on some engineering uh, perspective. Yes, and do you think that engineering background influenced uh, uh, you being uh, involved with developing OCS and like giving you that perspective into like the problem solving as engineers see the problems and... Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think that, that engineering education was, was very important. In, in how I see things and, and what I've done in my career. I think without that, maybe my path would be very different. And I think it's uh, serendipity that at times you, you do things through your career, not through your own personal choice, but that ultimately leads you to um, something that you never thought you would do. Very uh, amazing journey, uh, educational journey. After you um, did, uh, after you um, get your master's, you apply to medical school and you get your MD from Emory, and right? Uh, yeah. Yes. And um, you always said that you were always interested in pursuing medicine. Was that a personal choice or it was a Persian parent? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure it has, all of that has something to do with it. I think that um, my interest uh, began in medicine. I still remember somewhere in 1960s, 1968, when the first human heart transplant was performed, um, I have this vivid memory that we had a, um, at that time, we had a black and white TV, and I was, I don't know, six or seven years old. And uh, when I heard about that, um, it, it came to me that maybe this is what um, the career that I want to pursue. And I can't think of a more rewarding profession where you actually do what you are passionate about, but at the same time, you help others. So in that sense, that was my calling. And, um, and I tried to pursue that. And I think that my mother had, God bless her soul, that she certainly had an influence on this. And, uh, and without a question, it is partly your own wishes, partly your surrounding, and partly your family that dictate how you decide on your career paths. Yeah, definitely. Uh... And I'm sure your parents have, uh, are super proud of you. <laughs> uh, we're the, uh, I guess, uh, the ultimate Persian <laughs> uh, childhood, like Persian parents dream for. And um, did you, so you said that uh, 
your motivation to pursue medicine was seeing the first heart, uh, first heart transplant. Uh, so was your, you always knew you wanted to be a heart transplant or a transplant surgeon or? Well, I knew that I wanted to be a surgeon. Yeah. So that's, that was the intention that I went to medical school. And, um, and as I finished my uh, medical school, I was um, advised by the chairman of medicine and the dean at the medical school at Emory that they thought that I should uh, pursue a career in medicine. And um, I think it was partly the fact that I had scored very well and I was top of the class and they felt that it would be a waste if somebody becomes a surgeon, um, if they are, um, if they have done well in medical school. And um, so they insisted and I, I then conceded and I decided to pursue internal medicine residency. And as you can see from my CV, I actually did three years of internal medicine residency at UCSF and did a year of cardiology fellowship. And then at that point, I decided that I would not be happy if I just do internal medicine or a cardiology specialty. And I realized that it took four years of my life, but I decided that I would be better off changing path and uh, going into surgery. And that is how I decided to come down to UCLA to do general surgery and then cardiothoracic. That's definitely a, a lot of dedication because yeah, I saw that on your resin, uh, on your CV and I was like, why did you do two sets of like full residency and fellowship uh, back to back? Um, do you, uh, uh, so yeah. Uh, and let, now let's talk about you as a, uh, as a heart transplant, as the, I'm sure as the surgical director of UCLA's heart lung and heart lung transplant program, you see a lot of, you have to make challenging decisions on a daily basis, not just for uh, specific patients that you're doing surgeries on, but uh, also the greater uh, design of the program and the future of the program. Can you walk us through some of like the, uh, uh, first of all, like your routine day as a surgeon and as a surgical director and what are some challenges that you face? Sure, um, as you may know, <clears throat> a uh, cardiothoracic surgeon or even a heart and lung transplant surgeon, in addition to the transplant, um, they do a lot of cardiac surgery. So I operate on the heart and doing bypasses, doing valves and other types of surgery. So my typical day begins usually at around 7 a.m. with a meeting, which starts with the selection of patients. As you know, we have a selection meetings for candidates for heart and lung transplantation, where the cardiologist, pulmonologist, social workers, psychiatrists, and different physicians of disciplines, um, we meet on a regular basis and discuss any patient who is being considered for transplantation. Those meetings usually take about an hour and a half or so, and um, uh, we make decisions about who should get a transplant and who should not, who is not a good candidate. Then I, um, we have, uh, I have my daily operating schedule where I go to the operating room and um, we usually start the case. And um, as, as a UCLA surgeon, um, we have trainees. We have medical students, we have residents, we have cardiothoracic fellows who help us and learn while we do the surgeries. So um, usually the chest is opened by the one of our fellows, which is somebody who is in their seventh year of training after medical school. And then we, I usually help them or they help me depending on the level of complexity of the case to do the surgery, which may take anywhere between four to six hours. So at around four or about two or 3 p.m., we are pretty much done. And the team usually consists of about 10 to 12 people in each operating room who help us with the cases. The rest of the afternoon depends on the day of the week. There are activities, research activities that I'm involved in, administrative work for the program. And um, during that time, I get calls about donors. As you know, we have one of the largest heart and lung transplant programs in the country. And um, there are calls that come 
regarding that a donor that has become available anywhere in the Southwest or in Western United States for one of our recipients. And as a surgeon and with, cardi with the help of our cardiologist and pulmonologist, we make a decision regarding if a donor is suitable for a patient. If we make a decision that that is the case, then we, either the patient is waiting in the hospital or if the patient is at home, our coordinators try to bring the patients in the hospital and then get the, the laboratory tests done, the preoperative work test is done. And then we make a decision regarding the timing of the transplant. So we send the team out to the donor hospital where they uh, take the harvest the organ and they bring it back to UCLA and we will do the transplant any time of the day or night. And um, they always take precedence over our regular heart surgery cases. In other words, those cases get canceled so that we can take care of these patients. Uh, what percentage of these, like, I don't know how like routine the use of OCS is at your, uh, and your routine uh, work, like what percentage of these you use OCS to transplant them? Because uh, to transport them, because like, because you said, you mentioned like they can sustain the tissue, uh, the organ for a long time. So if uh, you use OCS, it might help. Um, I don't know. I, I yeah, I was just curious how routine the use of the OCS is. Uh, the OCS for the heart was approved in, in April of this year. Oh wow. So the lung has been approved for about a, two years or so. And we are actively involved in using this technology on a regular basis at UCLA and many other centers throughout the, uh, the country. There is increasing evidence that this technology has the potential to allow us a better, for a longer period of time to keep these organs alive. But uh, this might be a transplant. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I think the, the real potential of this technology is to allow us to change the donor organ. And by that, I mean, um, let's assume or let's think about in 10 years from now, we would actually get a donor um, who has a, let's say, A blood type. But the recipient is O. You obviously cannot put an A in, a, in an O recipient, but maybe on the machine, we can cleave the antigens so that we can convert all the donors to a universal donor. Um, what is another potential? Uh, the potential technology is that we can potentially remove all the um, MHC antigens. So a donor heart or a donor lung would be recognized self and not foreign anymore. So you don't have to give immunosuppression. And the reason that that can happen is because the heart or the lung is metabolically active. We cannot do that on ice because the heart or the lung is flaccid. It's, it's not metabolic, metabolically active. Whereas on this technology, we have a bioreactor. We have a mechanism that actually can, will allow us to change a human organ to make it a better organ for future transplantation. Oh, definitely an amazing technology, uh, as I said before. Um, and so let's talk about COVID because like COVID not only like upended our lives, but also like it had a very, uh, even like worse adverse effect on the people in the medicine, in the field of medicine. A lot of surg uh, surgeries got canceled. So I want to ask as first as a surgeon and then as a, director of this program that you have to make um, higher level decisions, how those challenge, what are some challenges that um, you face because of that, the whole COVID issue and how you got to uh, about addressing them? Well, as, as, as you mentioned, the COVID has impacted everyone's life and um, the professional lives in the hospital and the care of the patients was also greatly impacted by, by this pandemic. With the onset of this pandemic, we pretty much stopped elective surgeries. Our ICUs were filled with patients who had COVID and had developed severe respiratory issues with that. In fact, the cardiothoracic surgery ICU at UCLA, which is a 24 bed ICU, was pretty much occupied with patients, young people who had COVID and were on the ventilators 
and some of them were on ECMO. ECMO is a machine that allows exchange of um, oxygen and carbon dioxide for patients. And um, as a result, it impacted our daily lives in that we could not do the surgeries. One of the issues for us was that, um, how do we conduct heart and lung transplantation at a time when there is a pandemic? So, and nobody knew. And there were some who were saying that, oh, this is nothing, but keep in mind that just imagine giving COVID to a patient during the organ transplantation and then suppressing their immune system, which you need to do for organ transplantation. This would be the worst combination. I could imagine that we would be on the front page of the New York Times or LA Times that we had transplanted a COVID positive donor in a patient who had no COVID and was suffering from another disease, but died of COVID. So as such, we had to make some uh, drastic decisions and, um, and we had a, a national call and, and on that call, we made the decision that we are going to demand that every donor that um, is a heart or lung donor, that they have to do a special type of specimen from lower down in their lungs. And that test has to be negative before we accept that. Some centers did not subscribe to that notion. And in fact, there were two patients in Toronto who died and there were another patient in, in, in Chicago, but we decided to pursue that path. And for the first week or for the first several weeks, the program was not very busy. But then as that process became widespread and adopted, the program started coming back. And at that year, we did 120 some lung transplants, which was one of the busiest years we've done. And uh, without a single case of COVID transmission, during in the middle of a pandemic. Did you see an increase in overall like need for lung transplants because of like the whole, uh, because of COVID? Because I know like it causes like necrotic pneumonia and like uh, a lot of people lose uh, their lung function. So did you see an increase in the need for lung transplants or not? Uh, we, we are still seeing the impact of um, lung disease related to COVID. I um, have done a transplant on a, young person, a 22 year old uh, man who, um, who developed COVID and developed heart failure from it. Not necessarily lung failure, he got a heart transplant. And right now we have another 27 year old person who has a one year old daughter who has been in the hospital for the past nine months on ECMO on a machine in RICU. And um, he was so debilitated that he couldn't even stand up or walk but now slowly has improved. So he's walking and he's now being active. We are hoping to get him some organs or some lungs. He's the patient who may need a double lung transplant within the next few weeks. So it has impacted the way we um, see end stage heart and lung diseases. Uh, def you're definitely, you and your team are doing God's work, uh, saving lives. Uh, now let's talk about the ELS award. You received this award in 2017 in recognition of um, all the great work you've done. I wanted to ask you about that. When did you hear about that? And uh, what was the, uh, what went uh, through your mind when you heard that you received the award? Well, I don't quite remember how I, I heard the news. I don't know if it was a phone call or, or an email, but it certainly was uh, surprising and, um, and obviously very welcome, but um, to be in the company of some of the um, well-established and well-recognized Iranian Americans and also other ethnic groups. Um, I, I think the concept of uh, recognizing individuals based on their merits is something that is, is well known in this, in this society as a whole. And I think that I'm deeply grateful to, um, to that uh, selection committee for recognizing the work that we've done. But I can tell you that it is not, um, it's not just me who has been able to accomplish this. This is taking a team's effort. Many individuals in, in our team at, at UCLA, as well as outside who have made it possible. And uh, of course, um, any successful individual um, would have to have a, a spouse who is very supportive and 
and a family because without that, I certainly could not have accomplished what I have. Definitely a well-deserved award. Uh, I'm going to change gears because uh, and talk about, because we are the Iranian students of California, I wanted to ask you about your, um, kind of like skipped over the, during the education phase, but like ask you about your immigration story. And because um, you mentioned you came here on a student visa and you faced all the challenges. Did you always knew that you wanted to stay here or like the plan was to get a degree here and go back home and all that decision? change because of the circumstances. Um, like many of my uh, colleagues, when we came before the revolution, I think everyone's goal was to get the education and go back. In fact, that was the expectation. Um, and I don't know when that decision was made that I will stay, but I think year after year and, and um, uh, after my training, um, it became quite clear that it's, it's gonna be very difficult to go back and um, given the circumstances. Um, and um, the decision was made to stay like many of you. Um, it was a decision by default rather than a active decision to say, well, I wanna live in the United States or, but I think that um, I, I still feel that, um, that um, I, I owe people in Iran and, and the Iranian society is something. I think it's our everyone's moral obligation to to think about that. And um, so, I have done the part that I can, which is to to welcome and invite and uh, train as many physicians as we can and bring them here and and um, and help them educate. And because if you train one physician, hopefully that physician will save many many hundreds of lives. Whereas by just me going and doing something, it would be one life. So, so we have, I have had affiliations with several institutions in Iran, including Masi Donishwari uh, Hospital, as well as Rejoi Heart Institute and Donishka Tehran. And, um, and um, we have had exchanges with their physicians, transplant program directors coming out here. I have gone there and I've had um, very positive interactions. And I think, um, every time I remain so impressed with the quality of individuals, their skill sets, their talents, their commitment, and their, their training. It's just the fact that the resources are not there for them to be able to um, to be real to believe to be fully realized. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that's de that's definitely uh, so great of you to share your expertise and experience that you have here with the physicians uh, back home in Iran. How have you stayed involved in the Iranian community here in the LA area or general in the US? And how have you been involved with, um, yeah, in general, how have you been involved with the Iranian community here? Well, I think that uh, being in Southern California, you're <laughs> fortunate in that you can't leave the house. <laughs> and I, I personally think that's a blessing. So I, uh, I, I welcome that and I think that it's wonderful. So, and um, I've had the pleasure of, of taking care of many Iranian patients in, in Southern California and, and being part of many of the organizations in, in any way that I can and, and try to support them. Um, I think that, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think it's uh, refreshing and, and welcoming to see an organization like this that supports the Iranian students and and the networking and uh, there are similar societies and different disciplines and uh, you know professional organizations that um, I have been involved in uh, with Dr. Nabob's support and involvement as well. So um, we will um, and I I look forward to an opportunity to support them in as many possible ways as possible. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, as a student group, I'm gonna just like ask you some general advice questions for students. Uh, most likely a lot of our audience uh, for this are gonna be pre-meds or MDs going for residency. Any uh, word of advice for pre-meds, MDs, people thinking about pursuing medicine? Well, um, I can let you know that I can share with you that I think it's a incredibly um, gratifying career. Um, I cannot think of um, anything that a human being can do that would be as 
personally gratifying as to be able to give a helping hand to someone in, in need. I also think that it is a, uh, a, a very demanding career as well. And uh, my, my advice is that um, first make sure that this is your calling. This is, this is your passion. This is what you really want to do. And then um, my second um, advice is that uh, put everything you got into it. Persevere and don't give up. I think that um, maybe I'm biased, but I think Iranians are incredibly talented, hardworking, and and um, and uh, and they need to persevere at what they think is their calling. If you put your mind into it, do not let obstacles block your way. And um, and keep persevering and doing what you what you really love, but give everything you got to make sure that you achieve your goal. Great advice. Yeah, definitely in medicine, you've got to have the passion for it to sit through all these exams from MCAT all the way to step one, step two, and all the way up to the board exams. Um, as a surgeon, I'm sure you deal with all sort of stressful situation and uh, split second decision making in the process. I wanted to ask you, uh, how would you manage a, what is your general rule about managing a stressful situation? Um, uh, try to manage it to get the best possible outcome. Um, in, in, in my profession, in my in, in surgeries, obviously you make um, decisions in a second that impacts the patient's life. So my general approach is that I, I remain as, as much as I can focused so that I uh, do not think about anything else but that specific situation at hand. I also try to remain as much as possible, especially when you have somebody's life in your hand, to remain calm because I think that there is nothing that would, would be more important than staying calm and collected under pressure, under those uh, stressful circumstances. And, um, and I think that if you have had the training and the commitment, I think that you will, you will do well under these circumstances and, and the patients will do well. And my advice is to stay focused and calm and it will probably get you through the most difficult circumstances. Definitely words that should be uh, inscribed in gold. Um, for uh, our for uh, our audience and for those watching on Zoom or Instagram live, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or think about them and we will get to the audience questions uh, shortly and uh, you can ask your questions from Dr. Abdelhadi. Uh, while people are thinking about their question or typing them and we receive them, I wanted to ask you um, uh, a few uh, general question. Uh, somebody wanted me to ask you, what would you have you done if you were not a surgeon? <laughs> well, first I wanted to become a soccer player. <laughs> that was my uh, first choice. That didn't work out. Then I actually wanted to become a pilot. That didn't, I, I guess, as I grew older, I decided not to do that. And then that was my third choice. So I still did okay. <laughs> Um, and uh, in school, uh, in general, what was your favorite subject and least favorite subject? I think my uh, favorite subject it, it was, um, I don't know if we used to call it calculus in Iran. I think it was... Hesab. Uh, Hesab. Hesab one, I guess. Hesab uh, one. And I, I know that my least favorite was the course, I, I think it was botany that you, we, they made us memorize the number of Goldberg and Dornberg and things like that. I don't know if they still do that. Yes. 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 They need to memorize those. So that was my least favorite. I think I'll still have nightmares of yeah. that if I get that wrong. The great hairs started from that. Yes. Well, uh, definitely share that. Uh, 
So I have not know about plant biology. <laughs> As somebody who did his high school in Iran, I came here. I took my concours in Iran. I was like, I don't know why I'm memorizing these. Uh, how is it going to help me? Uh, <laughs> and uh, if, uh, I think we should get to the questions so we have time. Anybody here? If you have questions, feel free to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go on. Go on. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will start uh, first. So I want to know what was your um, throughout these years. Obviously, you were working like probably more than 10, 12 hours some some days. And I want to see um, the uh, where your family actually any played any roles here, or how you obviously your family sacrificed, and you also sacrificed for your family as well. But like I, I do like the you know the relationship you have with the you know uh, with your family and your child and all this. Um, well, I think that um, for any successful person, there has to be a, a supportive family. And, um, and I think that I'm especially uh, blessed to be, um, to be part of that family and have that supportive spouse, wife who's here, and, uh, and my two daughters, because I personally think if I did not have them in my life, I would not be where I am. It's only through their sacrifices um, that I was able to do what I do. In fact, I think my daughter has a story where I missed her um, 16th birthday. I don't know for in the US, the 16th birthday is apparently has a special meaning for girls. <laughs> And, um, and I think I missed her 16th birthday. There is a, another part of the story in that we have a, um, we have a, um, a Christmas party for all the, um, her birthday is November and the Christmas party was in sometime early December. So she came with us and we were, and I usually take them because that's the only time that they actually get to see what I do on a regular basis. And they see some of the patients and the families when they show up. And this holiday party was for transplant recipients. And, uh, and one of the coordinators, one of our nurses actually grabs the patient who received the lung transplant that night where I missed her birthday to come to with a, comes to my daughter with a mask saying that, you know, I just want you to know that when your dad was not there on your sweet 16th birthday, that he was operating on me and, and saved my life. And, I think that my daughter keeps telling the story that she was somewhat speechless, and that happens very rarely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you want to go next? Yeah, I was actually going to ask if you had a specific number of locations that um, really stuck with you. It sounds like you've had many. Um, are there any that you could pick up on? I know you see so many patients every day, but did one of the things that you well, there are um, so many of them that it's it's um, it's difficult. But I think the one thing that the one patient that I actually want to bring up is um, a patient that I operated on actually in Iran. Um, when I went th when I was there in one of my trips, they found a um, um, miraculously. I think they found um, a pair of lungs, and. Um, through right sequence of events, they actually came and drove me to to the hospital where, and then this patient who's like twenty two year old cystic fibrosis patient, um, I actually did the 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 lung transplant and then we left that night back to the U S. and I never saw how the patient did, and the next time when I went back to Iran and um, was given a lecture, at the end of my lecture a uh, patient came up with a bouquet of flowers to the podium. And I didn't know any of this. And uh, he actually came up who was that patient who had married another young woman who had also cystic fibrosis, who had also undergone lung transplantation in Iran. They came up to the podium and, and uh, gave the flowers. I think that is a story that stands out in my mind. I can think of several others. In, in, in the U.S. that we have done and we have saved their lives. Uh, there are countless individuals, but, um, but I think that um, those are the moments that 
that you never forget and, and you treasure. Thank you so much for sharing that. These are stories that really reaffirm my passion for the future So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, hi, like the other, um, I share the sentiment that your commitment to patient care is very admirable, and that's something that we, especially as Iranians, can really admire. Um, for my question, I wanted to talk a little bit about your innovation with transplants. I know you talk in comparison between the conventional procedures of the past to now today. Have you seen any cons with the unique procedures with transplants? And if so, what are they? And have you heard of any other theoretical procedures with transplants or concrete or something like that? that are different from the one that are using? Um, transplant, as, as you know, is a replacement therapy, uh, replacement of one organ for the other. And you it's not completely free of um, adverse events because you have to take medications, immunosuppression for the rest of your life. And um, and moreover, the lifespan of the transplanted organ is not similar to the native organs. So you may need repeat operations. Um, and I think that transplant has gone through major changes, but the fundamentals have remained the same. We still do immunosuppression. And I think that um, what the future holds is that eventually, if we can somehow get rid of the immunosuppression, so that we can basically replace one organ with another organ, I think that will be transformative in the field of end-stage organ disease for humans. We're not quite there yet. Um, I think that in the next 10 to 15 years, the, um, the recent changes, advances in the field, I think that this organ care system or a, a, um, a version of this, will probably change the way we will be doing uh, human organ transplantation. I think for liver transplantation, um, cellular therapy will probably replace whole organ transplantation. By that, I mean, we would be injecting some, um, some precursor cells that would utilize the, the hepatic um, cytoskeleton and repopulate with normal liver cells. For human hearts, I think we are a little bit farther away for replacement therapy where myocardial cells can be replaced. But I think it's more challenging because it has to be coordinated and it has it serves as a, uh, a pump. So it has to be working in a uh, concerted, uh, organized fashion. And um, for um, kidney and, and the lungs, I think it's gonna be probably much more complex than, than we probably may not see a whole organ complete replacement therapy that would be something we would come up with something that would replace that at least in the next 10 to 20 years. But I think cellular therapy, genetic engineering, stem cell therapy are potential options and the lowest hanging fruit is probably liver transplant. Thank you for your insight, Yeah. Um, first of all, it's an honor to have you here tonight. I was wondering, uh, you already mentioned the passion and dedication about medicine, uh, but we have many physicians and surgeons in the United States. I want to know what makes Dr. Abdullahi so successful and so outstanding among other physicians and surgeons. Uh, we met, we touched the one one, which is family. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think that, um, I think if you are passionate about what you want to do and you give it everything you got, I think that you will succeed and in, in whatever you decide, I think that, um, but first you need to figure out what you're passionate about, what really wakes you up in the morning wanting to do, and then, then put everything you got into it. I can't imagine how many times I have canceled events or not. I'm trying to answer a couple of pages here that um, that I have decided not to do something or go somewhere or or do something because there is something else that I needed to do, which was more much more important. And that applies not only to medicine. 
if you are in engineering, if you are the CEO of a new company, if you are the entrepreneur who is building a new enterprise, those are the requirements if you want to succeed. I don't know any successful person who only works nine to five and takes an hour of lunch break. That's unfortunately the nature of the beast, uh, especially, especially in this country. Any other questions? Some questions online. Um, Dr. Adam, there are several questions. So, you know, if you, if you have maybe five more minutes, if not, we can also end early because I know you also. Sure, that, I'm okay. Maybe five more minutes. <laughs> uh, so, Nagin uh, from Zoom is asking uh, can you please comment on how do you, you know, I think touch base on this right now, but like, how do you balance this so that you know, you're very calm, you're very, very focused? So, how do you, like, after work, what's your routine to get back to that balance? that you have, that calmness and focus that you have? Um, I don't know if I'm always calm. <laughs> my, my wife would probably would be a better person to ask that. But um, but I think that um, my um, the other things in my life brings me balance. And uh, I think it's, it's integral to have variety of outlays for for ways that you can decompress. For some people, it may be just exercise. For others, it may be getting a cup of coffee and relaxing based on that. Or for others is um, doing Peloton or going to Soul Cycle. Or for others is going mountain biking or, or climbing mountains out. But whatever it is, um, utilize it because it's not a matter of, of not having time to do it. It's just that you need to do it to be a better practitioner of whatever art that you're doing. You cannot do this 24 seven. So find balance and find out what brings you balance in life and, and pursue it. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, Siamak uh, from Zoom is asking, you mentioned that you did two residencies. Uh, you know, each four years, I guess, uh, four period. So Siamak is asking, you know, did you ever think that, you know, you've spent four years already in your first residency, is it better that I now go and actually, you know, work as a, as a you know, as a doctor or, you know, what was the trade-off so in deciding, okay, no, let me actually do another residency. And he's asking, you know, if the person has this situation, how should they look at it? Because there's, I'm assuming there's always people second guess that I should take the A, direction or the B direction? How did that work for you? Well, I, it was not an easy decision because as you mentioned, it was four years of my life and probably the prime years of, of my life. But I knew myself. I knew that I was not going to be a happy cardiologist or internal medicine doctor. Not that there's anything bad about it. It's just the fact that it was not me as a person. And, um, and I felt that I needed to change, to change path even though it was, I think that it would be a very good life going into internal medicine and, and different disciplines of that. But um, it was not without trepidation or doubts, but I decided that that was what I needed to do. And for those of you who are in medicine, you know that um, I became an intern in general surgery after doing four years of residency and cardiology fellowship. And for those of you who know, interns in general surgery are usually the, the bottom of the totem pole. Everyone and anybody tells them what to do. I had janitors telling me that you need to move this way <laughs> rather than roll the bed this way. <laughs> so it was quite challenging, but, but I knew what would make me happy when I'm 40 years old. Thank you so much for that answer. There's a couple more questions, but I know you're out of time. So I'd like to thank you so much again, uh, everybody in the audience. We have, uh, you know, prepared a very, very small gift, Dr. Ardahali. It's from one of the Iranian artists who has created a, um, you know, a kind of, he has put a lot of energy, a lot of, you know, um, time to create uh, something unique about Shahnameh. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, he's here, he has, you know, he's going around uh, in the United States. If people are interested, you know, I re highly recommend buying it. You know, we all have puppets in our house, but we don't have Sean on that. So we thought that, you know, we would give this to you as just a very, very small token of appreciation of your time. Thank you so much.
I wanted to just mention that this wouldn't have been possible without our co-sponsors, especially with part of the quality center. You have came on, uh, everybody knows came on my life, and I wanted to really, really thank him. Parts of Quality has been co-sponsoring our events, you know, consistently providing us with a lot of support, not just, you know, monetary support, but actually a lot of advice. You know, this, you know we were all doing this for the first time, so we got a lot of advice, and having came on and, you know, reaching out to me and asking him questions is just a great, great source of, you know, source of help for all of us at night. So thank you so much, everyone. Really, really appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Adahali. So we have a uh, try here. Uh, everybody, please uh, feel free to, you know, uh, take some something to eat here, and then we will go downstairs in fourth floor. Uh, same room, just in downstairs, where we have uh, provided some food and we have some social networking hour. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, it was a pleasure. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>